around here, we're going to do the announcements first. So if you would look at the back of your bulletin for the announcements, please. We have many people to pray for, um, listed here, and also those who may be suffering from an illness or a family situation and are being quiet about it. We pray for them and hope that they feel our prayers, our silent prayers. An update, Bob Phillips is in the hospital in Aurora now. Um, open heart surgery went really well, but he's got to have a lot of therapy, so um, keep him in your prayers. He's very happy to be in Aurora. A food pantry for November and December will be monetary donations to help with the, food, the preparations for the Christmas food baskets. Youth group will meet on Wednesdays, 2.15 to 3.30. Schedules may change according to holidays, so kind of keep that in mind. We'll decorate the church for Advent right after worship on December 3rd. A light lunch will be provided. At this time, we only need one more volunteer to bring bars. So if anyone would like to do that, please let that all us know. And you see, yeah, you have a handout in your bullets, and she's quite organized. So take a look at that. CWF will meet December 5th for our Christmas lunch at Rats Cafe at 11.30. Uh, bring a, a gift of $10 or less for the gift exchange. And the Christmas cheer program received a total of $450 from our church uh, in our congregation, and thank you to all. Your generous gift will make some of our elementary students very happy on Christmas. At this time, will you please stand as we sing our first hymn, page 137 in the chorus book, How Majestic Is Your Name.
you in thanksgiving and adoration. We praise you and fall on your mercies. Forgive us for being prideful and refusing your grace and mercy. Forgive our hardened hearts and sinful ways. Thank you for loving us so much that your patience endures forever. As we prepare to have the offering taken up today, I wanted to share something uh, with you from 1 Thessalonians and Romans. It says, when your mind is occupied with thanking me, you have no time for worrying or complaining. If you practice thankfulness consistently, negative thought patterns will gradually grow weaker and weaker. Draw near to me with a grateful heart and my presence will fill you with joy and peace. Will the deacons come forward? Israel, and 
There's 12,000 from each one. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Which means what? And so be it. <laughs> Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. So, so be it. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne who will shelter them with his presence, they again will not hunger, again they will not thirst, the sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. And the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hands. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea turned into blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded his trumpet. And a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky to a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. And the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. So that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. And as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the air call out in a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So this worked bad enough. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. And the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke and from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. And they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes. And during those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons, the idols of gold, bronze, silver, stone, and wood, idols they cannot see or hear or walk. They did not repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. The reading from the one book that is promised to be a blessing for reading it. Thanks be to God. Okay, well that was heavy stuff. We're going to have the kids come on down. I only have two kids today. Good grief. Last week, um, God provided just enough. 
this week, and I got more than enough. Have you ever heard of the book Revelation? Yeah. yeah. Was that kind of scary stuff we talked about? It is. But here's the thing. If you ask Jesus into your heart, you guys would have enough. But if you ask Jesus in your heart to be your Lord and Savior, you're not going to have to worry about any of this. Because you're not going to see any of it. All this takes place way after we've been raptured into heaven. Which is kind of the way it works. But the cool thing is, it's going to be best than any million Christmases put together. What is Christmas? I have a Christmas. Jesus was born. He came from his throne room down to earth. And what we're reading about in Revelation is when he comes back from his throne room. To get us, and actually we'll have already gone up, but he's going to come back and he is going to put a, an end to all this stuff that's going on. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more any of this stuff. He's going to reign for a thousand years and there'll be peace. That's kind of hard to fathom, isn't it? With everything going on in the world, that it just be peaceful? How about, did you catch that one verse where it said that all of a sudden in heaven there was complete silence for half an hour? That's kind of weird, isn't it? Could you handle a half hour of silence? No, I know. We're just so used to all the noise and the chaos. We couldn't even think about the silence. But here's the thing. We looked last week at Thanksgiving at the Seven Seals and all this horrible stuff. And I'm like, God, why would you have me talk about horrible stuff on Thanksgiving? And he showed me that was the best thing to be thankful for because God doesn't just put an end immediately to everything. He keeps putting out all these judgments, all these. Have you ever gotten in trouble by your mom or dad? Yeah. Do they do it because they hate you or because they love you? Because they love you. That's right. And God loves us so much that for those who are still left, he keeps giving them more time and more punishment until they're willing to repent and accept him. So those 144 were. We're going to look at that a little more, but I think you're going to have Sunday school. Yeah, so you're not going to get a part of that. So I didn't want to leave you with all the doom and gloom and then go, okay, bye, go to Sunday school. Because <laughs> we're going to talk about all the cool stuff up here, too. But that's it. God loves us so much. He keeps, for those who don't get to go to heaven right away, He keeps giving them another chance and another chance and another chance. Do you know what the big word repent means? I'm sorry. Do you say I'm sorry? <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> no, I have to. <laughs> That's basically it. God just wants us to say I'm sorry and accept that free gift of salvation because he loves us so much that he wants a personal relationship. Well, so what I came up with this week has been different every week. So since we're talking about the seven trumpets, I got bugles. I thought that was kind of cool. Do you like bugles? Yeah. It's snack. It doesn't matter, right? It's cheesy. That's all that matters. Cheesy and crunchy. Okay. So while you're downstairs in Sunday school and you're eating your bugles, just remember that God is sounding the trumpet, letting people know that they needed to return to him. And so that's our job, to go tell as many people as possible about Jesus' love and why they need to accept him because he's coming back. And they don't want to miss it. They don't want to be around for the rest. Okay. Much better than something. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. That you just continue to love us and love us and love us, and you, you will go to all ends and lengthen it out as much as possible so that way just even one soul will accept you as Lord and Savior and be up in the air in heaven with you. Thank you for that gift. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go with April. I think she's got some cool stuff. Well, if you noticed in your bulletin, the handouts, I finally did it. I know I've been saying it, and I gave you an extra one since you had to wait. So the top is, this is a timeline on Revelation. Now, if you've read the book, it does not go in chronological order. So if you try to read it that way and try to make sense of it that way, that's why you're confused and why it just gets worse, because it's not. It, it's kind of, it's in three different sections. <clears throat> but then below, it says Revelation made simple. <laughs> I don't think it makes it simple, but at least lets you know what each chapter is talking about. Well, we looked <clears throat> at the seven churches. We've looked at the throne room of God. We've looked at Jesus 
Jesus, who was the slain lamb, who came. He came the first time, right? As the lamb, as the suffering servant. But when he comes back, he's coming back as what? The lion, the king of Judah. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at six of the seven seals. And as we talked with the kids, how did that work with Thanksgiving? Because God loves us so much. He's just kept lengthening this out until people finally, finally accept him. Unfortunately, though, not all will. So today we're going to look at the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And as I said, the seventh seal ushers in the seven trumpets. Um, you know, I thought about that. You know, a lot of times we come to God in times of comfort, when everything's going good, we're happy and excited, and, and that's when we meet God. And that's when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. But for, I would argue, for a lot of times, and for most people, it's during the discomfort. <laughs> when God has put the heat on, and the trials and the tests, that we finally come to him. That's why these judgments, Jesus told us from the very beginning that the judgment was coming. And it's not because he hates us. It's the opposite. It's because he loves us, because he knows that there's so many, and then unless the pressure squeezed. Yeah, just go by the time. So we saw the seven seals are broken. Jesus has just now opened the seals. And he was what? The go up. He was the only one who could open that scroll and start popping those seals. We looked at the seven trumpets now today. And this is where God will dispatch seven angels and they'll announce the judgments and they're coming on the earth. And then look at the seven bowls will be poured out. This part is actually a succession of events that will unfold. So it starts out with this 144,000. Who here has ever heard of that? Have you ever had anybody come to your door in a white shirt and black pants and black tie and tell you all about the 144? No? Nobody ever has? <laughs> Or else they gave you their little pamphlet to tell you about the 144. Well, here's the problem. It's not talking about Gentiles. It's not talking about Jehovah's Witness. They would like to think it is. But how sad is that? There's 8.4 million Jehovah's Witnesses, and if only 144,000 make it to heaven, oh, that's going to leave, what, over 7 million that didn't make it. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's not good. Or 8 million. No, this is talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, and he even tells us that that's it. It's a representation, but now is this the ones from before? No, this is the ones during the tribulation. Again, all this takes place after the rapture. So hopefully you've accepted Christ, you're going to be gone, and you're going to be out of it. This is the Jews. We like to look at this through Western eyes, through Gentile eyes. Now, the majority of this is for the Jewish nation who believes that the Messiah has not come. They missed it the first time. And Jesus is doing all this to turn his people towards him. It's open for the Gentiles too, but the focus is on the Jews again. So this is 12,000 from each tribe. And I put this in there because I think this is really interesting. If you talk to people who are atheists or Jews no, Jesus. Yeah, they like Jesus, but they don't think he's the Messiah. You know, sometimes the hardest thing is that 18 inches, the distance from here, they have a lot of head knowledge, but to the heart knowledge, that can be the most detrimental. So there's going to be a lot of Jews that are going to come to faith during this tribulation time. In Revelation, we're going to get to chapter 11. I've mentioned this a few times about the two witnesses. I would argue that those 144,000, they become like little mini evangelists. They go out and they continue to talk to their Jewish brothers and sisters about the Messiah. But I think that they heard it from the two witnesses. <laughs> they come down because their job is to proclaim the gospel message for that three and a half years. This is after um, the tribulation time is seven years. And this is a halfway point of three and a half. This is when the Antichrist changes and goes from being peace to not peace, and that's when the two witnesses come in. So it's just these 144,000, they're the ones that end up, that John sees around the throne, and he says, you know, who are they? Sir, who are they? And the angel goes, 
He asked to John, who are they? And John goes, well, you know. Have you ever done that? Somebody asks you a question? You have no clue? You go, well, you know. You ask me a question. It's, it's the thing, you know? It's the, yeah, it's the, the heaven thing, you know. It's, he says the 144 are those who accepted Christ in that tribulation, those who were given white robes and were washed in the blood of the Lamb. They're going to be up there worshiping God, day and night, in the throne room. But then John says, then I saw a multitude. I couldn't even count them all. It's not just the Jews and Gentiles, everybody that were up there. Everybody who was martyred. Again, this is in the tribulation time. So, for those of you who know your Bible, you'll notice some little fun facts. I love this, how God puts all these little puzzle pieces together. If you just read Revelation, you're only going to get a little snippet of the story. You have to know Genesis. You have to know the pieces of the puzzle from Isaiah and Zechariah and Jeremiah and Matthew. All those little pieces. Hosea, they come together. So the 12 tribes are the 12 sons of Jacob. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Hopefully this is a refresher. You have the 12 sons. In Genesis, he has a son by the name of Dan. That was the tribe of Dan. Now, Joseph was in Egypt. He was the one who was sold into slavery. When his dad, Jacob, gave the prophetic blessings on each one, he gave Judah the blessing that out of you the Messiah should come. That's where the scepter would not leave the tribe of Judah. That's how we know that Jesus was coming from the tribe of Judah, and he would be the lion of Judah. Then he gives to Joseph and he gives him a double blessing. Now Joseph was living in Egypt, so his name doesn't show up, but his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, do. Levi is not mentioned in Genesis because he was, little, he was the priestly tribe, and so they were their own little off to the side. Part of it, but I mean they were set apart. When we get to Revelation and you start reading through these names, you go, yeah, Reuben and Gad and Asher and Nabali and Manasseh and Simeon. Oh, Levi's included. And you had him on 12. Now, wait a minute, that'd be 13. And you say, Ishar and Zebulun. Joseph, Joseph's in here. He wasn't there before. But you notice that Ephraim is not. And Benjamin, who's missing? Dan. There's a reason for that. A lot of people believe. So the problem is with Dan. Halfway through, they turned away from God. In fact, they picked up and moved. They moved to the most northern part of Israel, right at the base of Mount Hermon and off to the left. Now, what did I say about Mount Hermon? That is the mountain that the fallen realm have claimed. It's where all the temples were. It's where the gates of hell, the, the call it is. Dan took all that ground right around there, and it's called Tel Dan. We were supposed to get to go there when we went, and we ran out of time. But they left God in search and worship for all this fallen realm. Dan's not listed. A lot of people believe because of the prophecy that was given to Dan, the blessing from Jacob, that the Antichrist is going to come from the tribe of Dan. Not everybody agrees with that, but that could be a very solid argument. And why is it? Because he says in Genesis 49, Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so the rider falls backwards. There's a lot of imagery there that you have to kind of know that it's the serpent. And so that's where a lot of people really believe, and he's going to be the Assyrian, that he could come from, from there. Ezekiel 48, though, also, this is the cool thing. Well, Dan has been removed. In the very end, that last thousand-year reign that we will get to in chapter 20, Dan shows up again. So they have not completely lost their inheritance with God. They've been removed for a time, but they will all be reunited again in the end. Ephraim was another one that they were worshiping other idols, and so they think that's another reason why Ephraim is no longer and why Joseph takes the, the spot. <clears throat> so, he says, I saw seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. They didn't have it to begin with. God had to give them the trumpets. But before they blew it, what did I say happened for half an hour? 
Silence! Can you imagine that? We're not even talking crickets because that wouldn't be silence. Who has ever sat in church and somebody said, we're going to take a minute or two for silent prayer? And you sat there going, wow, this is a long time. It's really quiet. A half an hour, silence. It's a holy, reverent pause for, about, for what is about to happen. He says, and then he talked, I talked about this before, that golden censer. What is it? It's, it holds incense. But it says the incense are the prayers of the people. I'm going to keep hammering that because in every chapter it talks about it. It means that every prayer you have ever prayed to God, not only has God heard, but it's been recorded. It's been saved. And it turns into a fragrant offering. Yeah, just because God hasn't answered your prayer the way you wanted it, doesn't mean that he hasn't heard it. And it's those prayers that he mixes with fire from the altar. Now, wait a minute, you go, altar? We're in a throne room. Yes, the altar of God, the altar that was a Shiloh, the altar that was in the Holy of Holies at the tabernacle, the altar that was in the temple with the four horns, is before God's throne. And it's the fire from that. But we don't need sacrifice anymore. Christ has already died, but the altar is there as a symbol. And they take the fire from that and put it in with the incense, and he throws it to the earth. And you have rumbling and thunder and flashes of lightning and earthquake. And after this, I looked before me, and there was a great multitude that no one could count. Again, this is no longer the 144. This is everybody who has come to Christ. After the tribulation. But what are they doing? They're holding palm branches. Who here thought that when we sang Hosanna, you're like, wait a minute, I thought we were getting ready for Christmas, not Easter. Is it an Easter song? How about Joy to the World? How many people think that's only a Christmas song? You would be wrong. Joy to the World, Savior reigns. Look at the words. We're going to be singing that coming up. He's coming back. It's talking about that. The Holy City. We sing that and play it at Palm Sunday. It's talking about the end times. Not about Palm Sunday. They say salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. So be it. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. So be it. And the elders asked me these in white robes. Where did they come from? And this is where John goes, you know. And he tells them it was out of the great tribulation. So the first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down to the earth and a third of the earth was burned up. And then the second one was a huge burning mountain. This huge burning mountain is an asteroid. Now this is interesting because as I said, this is the second half of three and a half years of that seven year tribulation. There's actually an asteroid that has been out there that the scientists have been looking at. They've been keeping track of. And they even gave it the name Apophis. Do you know what Apophis means? It means the chaos dragon. Oh, wow! <laughs> who do we have at the beginning of Revelation? The chaos dragon, the God's dude. And who do we see at the very end of Revelation? The chaos dragon. Christians did not name this asteroid. The secular realm did. Now, there's even the predictions of the exact date of when it's going to hit, but I'm going to digress from that. But it says this asteroid hits the sea, and what it does is going to cause everything to happen. It's going to cause earthquakes and volcanoes, tsunami, everything. A third of the sea and the creatures of the ships will be destroyed. And then there's another great star, which would be like a meteor or another asteroid, that's going to come down. It's going to hit the rivers. And it's called Wormwood, and it makes the water bitter. Who here remembers in the 80s? <clears throat> Did you ever hear this, Wormwood? Did you ever listen to any of the Revelation people back in the 80s? They were like trying to make the end times be then and when Chernobyl burned up. 
Okay, I'm not that old, seriously. These people are older than me. When Chernobyl went, Chernobyl, where it was at, is literally called Wormwood. And what did the radiation do to all the waters? It turned to bitter. Anybody who drank from it died. It was radiation. Okay? So a lot of people were trying to make that be. Well, it's not. It's in the end times. But anyway. Then the fourth one. A third of the sun, moon, and stars were struck, and a third of the day is dark, and a third of the night is dark. We can't even, basically, the whole universe is just going nuts. Then the fifth angel sounded his trumpet. And I saw a star. Now we know in the Bible, it, depending on your translation that you read, the star will say angel. Star is another term for angels a lot of times in the Bible. It says, I saw an angel that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And the star was given the key. Now we know it has to be an angel, right? Because the star doesn't get a key. Given the key to the shaft of the abyss. <clears throat> when Jesus died, who holds the keys to hell and death? Jesus, and we know this because we read that in Revelation 1, right? When Jesus died on Good Friday, where did he go? He descended into hell. He preached to the captives. He, grabs, he grabbed the keys to sin and death and hell, and he ascended back up. But when he went to heaven, he was still holding the keys. We read that at the beginning. So Jesus has to give the key to one of the angels. I had a thought this morning, and this just may be me, and I can't say it was breakfast talking because I didn't eat breakfast, but, you know, Satan walks the earth. Satan doesn't live in hell. And Job, he even had access to the throne room of God. Could it be that Satan is the very one that Jesus gives the key to the abyss. Because this angel, and the thought that I had was, when Jesus says in Matthew, Behold, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That was what he showed me. Could be. He says, Then he opened up the abyss and smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace. And the sun and the sky were darkened by smoke. And you go, wow. Do you remember how dark and kind of foggy it was around here when we had the fires just from Canada and from western Nebraska and we've had it from Colorado? Or if there's a volcano that goes up, that ash, how dark it is. This is black as night from this smoke. And it says, the locusts came down on earth out of the smoke and were given power like scorpions of the earth. And it says, they could not harm those that have the seal of God on their forehead. Now, do you remember what happened when God said before they could unleash any of the trumpet sounds? They had to wait until God had sealed those on their forehead with his mark that had accepted him. Don't you see the irony of this? Everything that the Antichrist does is a total opposite or the same thing of what Christ did, but he turns it. What does the Antichrist require? Did you receive a mark on what? Forehead or your wrist? It's not how it stands. God seals him. Reminded me of the Passover with the Jews. What did they need to do for the angel of death to pass over? They needed to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. These are the ones that have been sealed who have accepted Christ. It says that anyone else who does not have the blood of the Lamb, the seal on them, will be tortured for five months. They can't kill them, but they'll be tortured. Now, I've talked about this too, but this is a cool connection. If you go back to Genesis, the flood. Why did God cause the flood in Genesis 6? The giants were on the earth. Where did the giants come from? The Nephilim? angels when they procreated with the humans. We're not supposed to do that. It was a complete no-no. Everything was so horrible that God had to start over. And how long did the water stay on the earth? Exactly five months. That's how long those disembodied spirits had to be underwater. How long did they get to come out and torment unbelievers? Exact same amount of time that they were underwater. 
He says, it'll be so bad that people see death, but they won't be able to, to be relieved by it. And now I know John is trying to describe this. He says, they're like locusts, but they look like horses, and they look like this, and they look like, he can't even imagine what they are. These disembodied spirits are coming back out. They need something, right, tangible. And I have argued that it's not going to be skin suits that are, that can be damaged. All this AI technology, artificial intelligence, the robots that are coming out, this kind of resembles a little more what that possibly could be. But their tails are going to be stingers like scorpions. They got the power to torment people for what? Five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyano. That is the destroyer. Who is Apollyano? Who took Greek mythology? Apollo. Zeus's son. Zeus's son. So the first woe was passed, and the sixth angel sounds his trumpet. Guess what? I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar. We talked about that, right? Here's the altar in the throne room, the four horns. It says, release the four angels who are bound at the great river of Euphrates. That's in a rock. That's where Garden of Eden was, where the four rivers, if you read Genesis, the four rivers come together where the Garden of Eden was at. When... They got kicked out and everything changed. There were four angels that were in charge of that whole getting the 200 to fall with the women. And four of them were put underground. And it says in the scriptures that they are locked up there until the end. Now they're released. And Azazel, we talked about him. The two goats, Yom Kippur, one is given to where? To go out into the wilderness to Azazel. One of those angels. I bring this up because it was crazy when I was talking about it before. This is where it all comes together. So the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour, day and month and year were released to kill a third mankind. Think about that. God had this all planned out. It was an abstinence for the very hour, the very day, the very month, and the very year. He put them down there, way back in Genesis, when they were going to come out. Now it says the number of the mounted troops were twice 10,000 times 10,000. Last week we looked at the people, right? It was the people, the angels, I'm sorry, not the people, the angels in the throne room. He said it was 10,000 times 10,000. We said it was 100 million. Now this is an army. 200 million. This is not human. We've seen that once the rapture happens, who's left? And a fourth, they're killed right away, and then a third, and a third, and a third, and a third. There isn't that many people left. This is not a human army. Who here remembers, again, I'll go back to the 80s with the Revelation pastors, you know, they would talk about when China announced they had, what, the two million man army, and everyone was like, oh, it's Revelation. Well, they ran this off. It's 200,000. And this is not human. How do we know this? Because the riders and the horses I saw in my vision had breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, yellow, silver. Their heads of the horses resembled heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. Do you know anybody that can do that? Or horses that can do that? I know dragons. This is not earthly. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of the fire, the smoke, the sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and their tails, for their tails were like snakes having heads with which to inflict injury. See this whole serpent thing back again? This is not human. So as I said, what does all this have to do with everything that we've talked about? From the very beginning of Genesis, before Genesis, this was a spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, all the way to the very end of Revelation. And yet, throughout all of that, Christ is still king. Christ came. He conquered sin and death. He has promised he is coming again to get his bride. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And he is coming again to establish his kingdom on earth. God is God Almighty. We looked at that last week. That means what? El Shaddai. Say it. El Shaddai. El Shaddai. You know Hebrew. Now you can speak it. 
So why has God continued to put the screws and the pressure down so much throughout all of this, all this doom and gloom and horror? It's because people kept refusing. Did you remember the last part that I read, those last two verses of chapter 9? It said, even in all of this horror, they still refused. They refused to repent. They refused to humble themselves. They refused to give up worshiping these demons, worshiping the angels, worshiping the idols. Christ is going to all lengths, searching out the one of the 99, the one lost lamb that's willing to repent so he can put his seal on their forehead. That's the kind of God we serve. A God who could have called it quits so many times throughout history, and even right now, and yet doesn't. Keeps giving another chance. As we get ready for Christmas time, as we focus this year on His coming again, that is what we are called to do. To evangelize to everyone else. We do not want even our worst enemy to have to go through what is going after we're gone. We want everyone we know that we can tell to join us. Now, whether they choose to accept is not our job, but at least they can say, I didn't tell you. Because we serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great I Am who was and is and is to come, the one gave up his own life so that way the free gift of salvation is open to all lest no man or woman should perish. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, I know that there are many, many on our hearts and minds. Um, those that maybe we just don't feel like we can lift up at this time that are there others that you want to lift up? Okay. If you bow your head with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and our hearts, maybe for some, are really heavy. It was yet another beginning of a holiday that's going to continue without the with the loss of a loved one, with an empty chair and hearts are breaking. There are those who still have relation living, but it is very much tension and difficult. Dear Lord, we ask for healing and reconciliation. There are those that are struggling with issues right now that they just have to keep to themselves, but Dear Lord, we know, thank you for reminding us that every prayer that we lift up to you is not only heard, but recorded and turned into a Roman incense. Thank you for being the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Thank you for loving us so much that you reached down and touched each and every one of our hearts and made us ready for when you come back to get your bride. But also thank you for reminding us that our job is to tell others about that gift so they don't have to go through those last days. It doesn't have to be that way. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you that your son knowing that there were times when we would just be in total silence or at a total loss for words, not even knowing what to pray that you know our heart. But he taught us a prayer that we can pray to you anytime. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. As the body of Christ, we come before Christ's feast. We come invited, knowing that when we have accepted Christ, we are not only welcome, but asked to come to the table. The table on which Jesus sat with his disciples that last night. And he lifted up the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he lifted up the cup, the cup of redemption, the cup of salvation. And he said, this is now going to be a new covenant, a covenant between myself and you. It'll be my blood, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, future. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so as the body of Christ, we come before his feast, eating and drinking, remembering, but most importantly, proclaiming to all that his sacrifice is for all, and he is coming back. If you would join with me in our last hymn, we're going to do Great is Thy Faithfulness, verses 1 and 3, which is in page 86 in the chalice.
as you have responded to ours. We pray to you in Christ's name. You are the one God, and we thank you that you have called us in unity with you and others. When we drink this cup, we are reminded in, that in Christ's self-sacrificing love, all the barriers that would separate us have been broken because of Christ on the cross. Your love has proven stronger than human fear or hostility. When times come in which we might, might be separated from your love, empower us by your spirit to ask and receive your holy love that we might break down barriers that separate others from you so that we might, might affirm around your table that we are indeed one in Christ's spirit. As you go out these doors today, go knowing that you serve a loving, risen God who's gone to the ends of the earth, to heaven and back, for each and every one of you. And he calls you to go out and give that message to everyone you come in contact with. May you go in that kind of love of a God, in the peace of his son, Jesus Christ, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that keeps all of us interconnected as one, in and through him, now and forevermore.